Until the 1980s, Air India was considered among the best when it came to luxurious air travel. It was a statesman's airline, and many at that time preferred to choose it over other carriers from all around the world, just for its pampered flying Maharaja experience that other carriers of that time looked to with utmost respect and envy. So what happened? How did the world's pioneer in luxury line aviation end up being the laughing stock of the industry? To answer that rather disheartening question, we have to travel back in time to the British-ruled pre-independent India. In the early 1930s, the airmails to India from all around the world were unloaded at Karachi through international flights, and from there it was forwarded to its intended destinations throughout India via trains, which was a painstakingly slow process. When everyone in India, including high-ranking British officials, were frustrated over the delay in receiving their airmails, a former Royal Air Force pilot from South Africa, Neville Vincent, saw an opportunity. What if he could set up an airliner that could pick up mail from Karachi and deliver it to India on the same day and thus drastically reduce the waiting period. He did not have the financial means to fund such an ambitious idea, so he pitched it to several of the biggest business houses in India, however, all of them rejected. Durabji Tata, who was the chairman of Tata Group at that time, was also not interested in this idea. However, his 24-year-old nephew, J.R.D. Tata, who was an aviation geek as well as the first person to acquire a pilot license in India, helped Vincent convince Durabji in supporting this venture. So in 1932, the duo started Tata Airmail, which was based out of a small hut with a thatched roof at Juhu Airstrip in Bombay, with an investment of 2 lakh rupees. All they had was two little de Havilland Pusmoth aircraft and a crew of two pilots, three ground engineers, four coolies and two security guards. The Pusmoths hauled about 25 kilograms of airmail along with two passengers from Karachi to Bombay via Ahmedabad. J.R.D. Tata himself piloted it from Karachi to Bombay, and from there Vincent took it to Madras. In the inaugural year of its ambitious voyage, Tata Airmail went on to complete over 2 lakh kilometers, transporting over 10 tons of mail and 155 passengers. The same year, it also launched its longest domestic flight from Bombay to Trivandrum with a six-seater Miles Merlin monoplane. Needless to say, they made a handsome profit of over 60,000 rupees in their first year. Their valiant efforts started to bear fruit as they expanded their service to Delhi, Gwalior, Bhopal, Indore, Hyderabad, Goa, and Colombo. Later, in 1938, Tata Airmail evolved into a fully functional airline named Tata Airlines. The airline's motto read, Mail may be lost, but never delayed. Passengers may be delayed, but never lost. In 1939, the world came to a grinding halt as the Second World War erupted and for the next few years, a rampant spree of gruesome death and unreal destruction shook the world to its core. But what makes Tata such a visionary is that he turned this crisis into an opportunity by deciding to manufacture bomber aircraft for the British government at his factory in Pune. Despite receiving approval, the Air Force no longer needed bombers, but instead required gliders, causing huge loss to the Tatars. Vincent flew to London to rework the deal, but due to war in Europe, he could not fly back, so to quickly arrive in India, he hopped onto a British Air Force bomber which would transport him to India, but unfortunately it was shot down near France, causing his death. This was a huge blow to JRD, as he had lost his partner and friend along with the chance to manufacture aircraft in India. However, he again managed to turn this challenging crisis into an opportunity by acquiring many aircraft from war-torn world markets at cheap prices to expand his fleet so that he could grow into an international airline. Following World War II, Tata Airlines became a public limited company in 1946 and changed its name to Air India. At that time, the crown jewel of its sizeable fleet was a 40-seater state-of-the-art Lockheed Constellation, which had a maximum speed of over 600 km an hour, which was faster than that of the Japanese Zero Fighter, one of the fastest aeroplanes of its era. In 1948, Air India commenced its maiden international voyage from Bombay to London. The passengers included VK Krishna Menon, who was the Indian High Commissioner to the UK, the famous cricketer Dulip Sinji, two cyclists on their way to the London Olympics and several businessmen from Mumbai. Within a short period of time, Air India became a reputed international airline and was considered the face of Indian hospitality. 
In 1953, the government decided to nationalize aviation in India with the Air Corporations Act. The private airlines operating in India at that time included several small airlines like Air Services of India, Airways India, Bharath Airways, Deccan Airways, Himalayan Aviation, Indian National Airways, and Kalinga Airlines. All of them were merged to form Air India for the international routes and Indian Airlines for domestic routes. Thus, the government took Air India away from the Tata Group, and Tata was forced to relinquish control of his creation. Tata expressed his grave disappointment at the government's decision to proceed with such a major step without consulting him. Tata was of the view that nationalization would not result in an efficient air transport system, but instead would mean bureaucracy, lethargy, and decline in employee morale. Meanwhile, the government maintained that nationalization would bring order to the industry, and that the Congress party had had a policy to nationalize all modes of transport for two decades. After an array of negotiations, he was allowed to remain as the unpaid chairman of the Air India Corporation. Over the next 25 years, through personal commitment, he maintained high standards of service at Air India, which enjoyed an excellent reputation among passengers. With the huge surge in the popularity of Air India as the last word in luxury line aviation, iconic bands like The Beatles and The Doors preferred Air India flights, and in 1954, with the delivery of its first super constellation planes, Air India inaugurated services to Tokyo, Bangkok, Hong Kong, and Singapore. In 1955, when Chinese Premier Zhou Enlai had to travel to Indonesia for the first conference of the non-aligned movement, China did not have the required long-distance aircraft, so an Air India flight was chartered to fly him and his team from Hong Kong to Indonesia. With its global success and steady inflow of cash, Air India introduced its first Boeing 707 aircraft in 1960, and just two years later, in 1962, it became the world's first all-jet airline. The same year, JRD Tata commemorated the occasion of their 30th anniversary by flying solo from Karachi to Bombay in a Leopard Moth plane which he would reenact again 20 years later for the 50th anniversary at the ripe old age of 78. One of the most mind-blowing facts is that in 1967, Air India placed orders for Boeing 747 aircraft two years before its first test flight, when no one even believed such a huge plane was possible. And in 1971, Air India became one of the first airlines in the world to have the iconic Boeing 747 double-decker jumbo jet in her fleet. It was branded as your palace in the sky, and rightly so, as the upper decks of the aircraft contained the iconic Maharaja Lounge, while the first class cabins were designed comprising rich tapestries and art that drew contemporary designs from ancient Indian motifs. The interiors were known as the most exotic and luxurious cabins in the sky, featuring cocktail bars and epitomizing the idea of the golden age of travel. It redefined the conventional style of luxury aviation, and Air India was in a league of its own under Tata's regime. J.R.D. Tata may be the father of Indian aviation, but apart from that, he has done many amazing things ahead of his time, like founding Tata Motors in 1945 and Tata Consultancy Services as Tata Computer Systems in 1968. He has also consistently worked to provide excellent working conditions for his employees, a culture that prevails even today. After the nationalization, the only personal stake Tata had in Air India was an emotional one. Tata took matters into his own hands and made sure that each passenger got the chance to indulge in the Maharaja experience, regardless of the class they flew. Once, he even rolled up his sleeves and helped the crew to clean a toilet. He once admitted that while he was the chairman of the Tata Group, he was effectively dedicating nearly 50% of his time to Air India, an entity that provided no financial rewards to him or his 50-plus companies. However, in 1978, Tata was humiliatingly fired from Air India by Prime Minister Moraji Desai, as apparently they had a difference of opinion over whether alcohol should be served on the airline. Desai ordered not to serve alcohol, which Tata opposed. After Tata parted ways with Air India, the airline started its slow descent in quality and popularity. His removal from Air India was quite devastating for him. Uh, he may not have shown it very much. I happened to have been with him in Jamshedpur when he opened the morning papers because 
he was humiliated by having to read about his removal in the newspapers. And I was with him that morning. And he was really crestfallen. This marks the end of both J.R.D. Tata's involvement with Air India as well as the golden age of Indian aviation. So how did Air India transition from being an invaluable asset to a multi-billion dollar liability? How did an airline which was considered the face of Indian hospitality become synonymous with poor service? We will discuss that in detail in our next video.